Okay, can everyone hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, it's great to be back at TAG after a very long absence. Um, <clears throat> I first attended TAG in Cardiff in 1983 as an undergraduate. Uh, I first presented at the London TAG in 1986, and I last attended TAG, the last Bradford TAG actually, in 1994. Since when I've done a number of other things, including uh, a little bit of politics, as Ben Elton used to say, and also including a lot of academic administration, so a range of very different things. Uh, and then I turned my attention to writing novels, and that's really what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to try to relate those experiences. So let's first of all introduce the site itself that I'm going to be talking about. Some of you may be familiar with it, some of you may not be. This is Lahoub B in Jersey. It is the largest of many passage graves on the island of Jersey and here you see it in suitably festive form um, covered in snow. Uh, this is the site as it appears after my excavations which were carried out from 1991 to 1994. Passage grave itself which you see here looking out through the entrance uh, that was first discovered in 1925 when the diggers, the, the excavators in the manner of the fashion of, of, of the age dug into it like moles and then lined their trench with concrete to provide a, an entrance to it. Uh, what I did was remove that concrete entrance and take it back to the Neolithic facade to ex actually expose the Neolithic structures of the uh, building itself because that's what it is. It's not a mound with a tomb underneath it, it's a building, and that's what we wanted to explore, and to explore all the evidence for activities that took place in uh, the forecourt area. By the way, if we were, if we were there in next week, we, assuming there were no clouds around, we would be able to see the, um, sorry, a few weeks ago, the sunrise at the autumn equinox which shines directly down this passage and that could not be seen that had not been seen by anyone between the end of the Neolithic when it was sealed up and abandoned and we'll come back to that and our knocking down of this tunnel because the tunnel was actually at a slight angle and consequently made it impossible to to see that so here's our excavation report that we published in uh, 1999 so that was the end of the excavation project and I walked away from it at the time saying, well, that's Lahoub B done and dusted. Except there, were, there was always something going on at the back of my mind which told me that it was not Lahoub B done and dusted, that there were questions I hadn't answered, that there were things that still needed to be said and thought about and reflected upon. I don't think I knew that I would come back to it. I probably thought that my students, students, students might come back to it, which they still might, and I hope they do. But, uh, you know, it, it appeared at the time to be the end of the process. And then, as things happen, um, things didn't go entirely as I, as I planned, and I ended up approaching it in a different way. But I want to go back in time first, to before the period of our excavations. I first visited the site when I was about 10 years old, and in a real sense, that's when the research for the, for the novels began. I'll come back to that too. But here we see, here I'm, I'm, I'm standing, taking this photograph, at the very foot of the, of, of the chapel. There is a, a cairn on top of which there is a medieval chapel, and into that medieval chapel has been inserted a 16th century crypt, this bell-shaped structure that you see at the bottom. And here I am looking out over uh, the sea, and what you can't really see very well from the photograph, but it is there, from that point at the top of the mound, you can actually see the coast of Normandy. From nowhere in Jersey can you see the coast of Britain, mainland Britain. Uh, you can see Guernsey, you can see Alderney, you can see the other islands, you can see Normandy. And while I was doing my PhD research in 1987, I was working in a, a room without any natural light, a storeroom, where I was spent spending my whole day measuring flint flakes and stone axes and identifying the provenance, the geological provenance of the axes, all this work. And at lunchtime, I really wanted to get out into the open air and come up to the top of the mound and look out and wonder about the people who actually made the objects that I'd spent my day measuring and recording the dimensions of. 
So we had axe exchange. Here we've got jadeite axes. These are not actually found in Jersey, but jadeite axes have been found in Jersey. And I knew that they must have been brought by boats from that coast that I could see over there by real people. And at the same time, we're dealing with the period in time at which people were first using bronze objects. And I was handling some of the earliest copper and bronze objects to be imported into Jersey. And I was trying to figure out what was actually going on, what was going through the minds of those people. And on one occasion, I can remember I'd been tucked away in this little uh, rabbit burrow of a, of a museum store and desperate to escape into the open air. And we'd had a storm recently and half these tiles on the medieval chapel had blown off and so we had uh, a tiler working on the site replacing them and he was the opposite to me he wanted shelter for his lunch because he'd been out in the elements all day and he'd left his ladder there up against the wall of the chapel and it was just too tempting I climbed it and crawled my way up onto the gable of the chapel and there realized exactly where I stood tottering at the very top of Hawkes's ladder of inference <laughs> unable to kind of really grasp these people and yet these people wouldn't let me go you know they were they were very much there in the background to everything I did they were at the back of my mind I wanted to get as close to them as I possibly could as an archaeologist it had never occurred to me at the time that I might be able to get even close closer to them as a novelist I wasn't at the age of 23 24 25 capable of writing a novel I hadn't done enough living or loving or falling in and out of relationships or grieving or being bereaved, all those things that actually have to go into a novel because they're part of being human. So I started writing novels in 2006. My first Undreamed Shores was published in 2012 and it is in a sense the novel of the PhD. It deals with all the issues and all the sites and all the art well not all the artifacts there are far too many of those uh, not all the sites either actually but it really does deal with the same issues that I was looking at in the PhD it's set in 2400 BC and it is on one level a coming of age story please come in welcome the second novel an accidental king is set in Roman Britain I'm not going to talk very much about that today because I talked about it at some length at the track conference in Leicester earlier this year and the third novel is Omphalos, uh, which was published in 2014. And that novel actually has an archaeological structure. The first two don't really have an archaeological structure. They've got a fairly conventional novelistic structure. Both, uh, well, one, the first one third person, the second one first person, but both of them from the point of view of a single male protagonist. Um, Omphalos, on the other hand, has six separate stories and they're nested within each other. So it's set out in an ar like an archaeological excavation. That you, like an archaeological excavation, you dig down stratigraphically through the layers. And then as you do the, your post-excavation work, you build up your understanding of the site the other way round. And so it's got these stories, Touching Souls, which is set in the present day, The Spirit of the Times, which is set in the Second World War, because the occupying German army built an observation tower, which you've nothing to see, well actually you can still see the bases of it on the site today, but they had an observation tower and a command bunker on the site, so the spirit of the time is set in the Second World War. The Infinite Labyrinth, which is set in the 18th century, again in those first photographs you didn't see the 18th century tower that was pulled down in 1925, which was a centre of a British spy network during the revolution, French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. So uh, the, the Infinite Labyrinth is set in the 18th century. Jerusalem, which is set in the 16th century, when uh, Reverend Richard Mabin went to the Holy Land on pilgrimage and came back and built the circular crypt. The Path of Stars, set in the 12th century, when the chapel was built. And the Song of Strangers, which takes you right back to the Neolithic. So as you read the novel, you go back from the present day through those periods to the Neolithic, and then you come back forward again to the present day. Not all the action takes place on this site, that would be boring, but uh, the site comes into it in every case, and in a sense I'm explaining the site as I go. Now, at this point it's worth reflecting back on the aims of the session. In some sense I feel like a bit of a fraud here. We're talking here in this session about the value of historical fiction 
as an archaeological technique. That is not what I did. Uh, it, we're talking about archaeological about fiction being part of the research process, not an outcome of it. My novels were written 20 years after all the archaeological research was finished. And my own fictional engagement in writing these novels, let's be clear about this, was self-consciously not an archaeological, but a literary project. And the use of the archaeological evidence was actually my literary attempt to create something original, do something that other people can't do. You know, comparing myself to a writer like Bernard Cornwall, who wrote about Stonehenge, and I write about Stonehenge in Undreamed Shores, well, Bernard Cornwall has a, a, a huge, a vast understanding of historical evidence. Actually, he doesn't have quite such a good understanding of archaeological evidence, and it shows. And I thought, well, here is something I can bring to it that not many novelists can. So it's a literary project, not an archaeological one. And so what I'm doing now is a kind of post hoc, after the event, sort of review of what, how it might have contributed to the research process. And for fiction to play that part in the research process, I think necessarily it would have to involve something different than spending 20 or 30 years cogitating over three novels. Bear in mind, by the way, I put the publication dates 2012, 2013, 2014. Those publication dates are accurate. But please don't infer from that that I write a novel a year. <laughs> that one was, was 30 years in the generation. That one was 20 years. That one was 40 years. Uh, in terms of reflection and experience. So don't expect the next one uh, <laughs> next year, because it's not going to happen. Um, well, I approach these novels thinking about the people and the places that I've been studying for decades. Um, and the first thing I come to uh, think about is oral cultures. It's actually, when I started writing Under Dream Chores, it was a real challenge for me. Putting myself in the mind of a character who has never read a book. A character for whom the written word doesn't exist. Now, I can't imagine that. You know, stories have been part of my life since my earliest recollections. You know, obviously, initially, my mother was telling me stories. But crucially, she was telling me stories that she'd read. In some cases, she was reading to me. And then she taught me to read. And then I went to school and perfected my reading skills and gradually worked my way through Ladybird books all the way up to George Eliot and Dickens and all the rest of them, Homer. Um, but I tried to get a handle on what oral cultures really would have felt like. And one of my starting points was this, The Singer of Tales by Albert Lord. Uh, <laughs> this is actually a study of Homer and the way in which... Homer is informed by earlier oral sources and what Lord did uh, and Milman Parry who, who worked with him was go to uh, what we now call former Yugoslavia and record oral storytellers in largely illiterate communities who were still telling songs, singing songs, telling stories in the oral tradition and looking at how they were constructed and relating that to how the Iliad and the Odyssey were constructed. I looked very closely at that this is a, a, a storyteller, a, a, a modern oral storyteller, Sally Pom Clayton, uh, who, who's the best one I've heard, I have to say, by a long way. Um, she's superb. I mean, she's, of course, highly literate, but she's also travelled the world and listened to people, some of whom are not literate, telling traditional stories. And she's perfected the art of telling them. So I actually went to several of her performances and listened to many more of them on the British Library Archive to get this idea of how a story would be told, or how a story might be told. How somebody living and, and building La Hoogby, working at La Hoogby, uh, living in this community four, four and a half thousand years ago, six thousand years ago, might relate to their own past. Because it seemed to me that any human community that was going to be believable had to have a meaningful relationship with its own past, which was necessarily very different from my relationship with our shared past, which comes almost entirely from reading books. So I looked at that. I also, of course, looked at the anthropological evidence at Malinowski, at the idea of the Kula cycle, at the idea of objects embodying stories, objects actually being defined by stories. How relevant was that to these stone axes, to these first metal objects, to which I give names in the story? 
objects as well as people have names in these stories. But actually, when I first started, I, I ended up being more drawn to Albert Lord's view of things and to Sally Pom Clayton's performances than I did to Malinowski. Malinowski features more in the, the PhD thesis, actually. But when I actually came to imagining it, you know, to giving names to these characters, to putting them in a situation and letting them come alive, I found myself drawn to that kind of storytelling. Now, this is something I put together, a story told in the third millennium BC about events in the fifth millennium BC. And I've used all of Lord's conventions. Towards the setting of the sun they rode, each day departing with the ebbing tide, until they reached a river's gaping mouth, beneath the shadow of a stony mound, a place fresh water might be had and rest. Climbing the headland they approached the mound, and saw that it was built of human hands, of stones built up on stones piled up on stones. Into the side of it were caverns wrought, eleven caverns built with massive slabs. Now, what I'm talking about is this. And here, in my thesis, I'm talking about how the site of Barnanez in northern Brittany, which is several hundred kilometres from La Hougue B, is so intimately close in terms of its morphology. Now, how does that happen? It's one thing to say, well, there's clearly an influence from here to here, sort of thing an archaeologist always says. You know, it, the form is almost identical. And yet, you know, how does that happen? Well, they're travelling around on boats like this. And so I actually write that into the story. And then in Ampelos, I come back to it and I write the story from the perspective of somebody in the time itself. The birds of the day have fallen silent and the sun is setting behind the shrine. Behind this, the fire crackles into life, its heat rising as the sun's warmth ebbs. An old, water, white -haired, an old woman, white-haired, her cheeks etched like the bark of an oak tree, sits on the ground in front of us and begins to tell us of her grandmother's grandmother and she passes around a bead that had been her grandmother's grandmother's. Bead's a real object. Now, there's a lot more that I could say, if I had more time, about the way in which I actually looked at various phases in the construction, the way in which I incorporate objects both real and imagined, uh, the way in which I look at this 16th century pilgrimage of which we have no record apart from the fact that it happened. And in Omphalos, I tell all those stories. But where does that leave us in terms of understanding what fiction can do as an archaeological technique, as, if you like, a heuristic device to enable us to better understand the past from an archaeological point of view, rather than from the point of view of an archaeologist who becomes a novelist and goes back to the material 20 years after the date. Well, it seems to me that we have two very powerful assets, and one is the power of place. That it's, it's A place is something that can easily spark off a story. Any storyteller, you take them to a place, like La Hougue B, but equally like the Tower of London or Stonehenge or Karnak Alignments, you know, they can tell you a story based on the place. And the other thing is the power of objects. You know, as archaeologists, we handle these things all the time. <coughs> We often want to know more than we possibly can know about you know, who made them and how they were used and what their significance was to the people who used them. Um, and what we can do is, 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 is think about these issues. Um, but whose stories? I have to say, as director of the dig, at the time, I don't think I could have thought about the stratigraphy of the site, which was immensely complicated. Uh, which I won't go into at all, um, I couldn't have thought of that at the same time as telling the stories. Stories were perhaps at the very back of my mind. So who should tell the stories? Should it be archaeologists? Should it be professional storytellers or professional writers in residence? Short stories and perhaps oral storytelling may lend themselves better to that role as being an archaeological technique than the novel, which is a lengthy process of crafting uh, the Americans have this wonderful idea called NaNoWriMo, National no Novel Writing we a Month, which we call November. And the idea is you can write a novel in a month. Please take it from me, you can't. <laughs> uh, or if you can, it, it's not a very good one. Uh, should it be students, whether they be our own archaeology students or whether it be creative writing students, or our own archaeology students or even local people kind of acting on 
influences by a professional storyteller or a writer in residence you know is there a place and i'm not suggesting here that fiction should be limited to public engagement but is there a case for actually bringing those two activities together getting a wide range of people to tell stories which are recorded in such a way not necessarily as finished literary products although a creative writing tutor or writer in residence could certainly help people with talent which not everyone has but with talent to develop them in that way um i throw those op the issues open to discussion um you know for me it's been a journey it's been a it's, it's been an interesting journey a fascinating journey a journey that has led me to ask new questions and frame those questions in different ways it was a literary project but now i think i am in a position to reflect on how that might have influenced my archaeology if i'd thought about it at an earlier stage thanks very much